So, to provide a little bit of context, you may remember that I made a, a small side note when we constructed in the constructor for our Caesar Cipher class that we need to revisit this to actually um, compress the key phrase. We're not allowed to have duplicate letters in the key phrase. And so we need to write a little method here, um, or we need to call a method and write the method down below that will basically check the key phrase for duplicates and get rid of any duplicate characters. Um, and this is a great opportunity to learn more about different methods we can call on strings. So we're going to add a java.comment here, slash star star enter. And the purpose of this method is it compresses the specified key phrase by removing all duplicate letters. And it takes one parameter, which we're going to call key phrase, and that is the key phrase to compress. Perfect. So we'll say public void compress key phrase. One parameter of type string called key phrase. And all our good stuff is going to work in, in here. Um, let's see. Let's actually call the parameter something else because we have an instance variable, I believe, already called key phrase. So I'm a fan of not naming our instance variables and parameter variables the same. So I'm going to call this init key phrase, the initial key phrase before it's compressed. This will make less chance I'm going to make a bug by accidentally referring to the wrong variable, if I forget to use this or something. All right, first step, we're going to say this dot key phrase, our instance variable, equals the empty string. So strings are classes, um, which means if we have an instance variable of type string, it is initialized to null, meaning there is no string object yet. Um, I could have said, you don't need to type this, I could have said something like this, this dot key phrase equals new string, you know, empty string. But we're kind of learning some shortcuts now with strings, and I can use what's called a string literal. Um, and a string literal is a simply a double quoted string, and I could put whatever I want in here, but I can also put nothing in here, and I get, still get a new string. It's just that there's no characters in the new string, okay? But there's still a new string object, and that's important if I want to call methods methods on it. Um, so just to fill that in, there we go. Um, string literals is like, it's an actual shortcut way to create a new string object, an instance of the string class. Whatever is in the double quotes, that sequence of characters is what that string um, will contain, okay? Um, and we got to do it all on one line, so it looks like this. Um, so that's like a shortcut way to create a new string. Um, even if that string is an empty string. So there we go. All right. We've called some methods on strings. We've called like two uppercase, two lowercase, replace, I think we did at one point. Um, we're going to focus on, on a subset of methods that are um, like kind of the set of methods that are part of the AP Computer Science Java subset. These are the ones that show up on your quick reference sheet. In addition, we're going to throw in like one extra one that isn't on that sheet, but it's super useful. So I think it's worth us spending a little bit of time on it. The first method we're going to learn, so we're going to like write a, a line that documents each method, and then we're going to have an example. The first method is the length method. The length method returns the number of characters in the string. Super useful. So I could say int key phrase length equals init key phrase dot length. We use the length method a lot when we need to know how many characters are, are in the string. 
All right, this next line of code is one of these unfortunate situations where we need to use a little something from our next unit, but we're not there yet. So we're just gonna kind of type it and we'll, we will spend lots of time and fully break this apart um, in our next unit. But that's like, how do we do a for loop? How do we set up a looping structure where we're gonna run the same chunk of code over and over again a certain number of times? The reason why we need this is we need to look at each and every character in the string. So we're gonna have this chunk of code that we can run and actually look at each of those, those characters. Um, some of you have already figured out this structure because you, you used it with your turtles. Some of you might want to use this when we get to the Cityscape lab. But here's the basic syntax. It's kind of odd, um, but that's okay. We'll get used to it next unit. So what this says, this for statement here basically initializes a local variable, in this case to zero. All the code between these curly brackets runs repeatedly as long as that local variable i is less than the key phrase length. And each time after the chunk of code in the curly brackets runs, we're gonna increment i by one. This is kind of a really weird and long way of saying, run the code in the curly brackets, key phrase length number of times. That's really all we're doing here, okay? This is where the syntax in Python is just a lot nicer. Um, but this is very flexible and powerful and we'll explore that more in the next chapter. But for now, just think of this as, we're gonna run this loop this many times, or run the code in this, these brackets, key phrase length number of times. All right, so that aside, let's look at our next method. Our next method is called the char at method. This method returns the character character of type char at the specified index. And the index is what is called zero based. And don't worry, we're gonna like look into this in more detail. Um, so remember, char is one of the primitive types we have, right? So if we're just focused on a single character, we can use the primitive type char, like it is the letter A, right? Um, let's see what I mean by specified index and zero base. So let's do a little example right here in the comment. Let's say the key phrase or the initial key phrase um, is the word Caesar, C-A-E-S-A-R. I'm only spacing the letters out so I can do some annotations below them, okay? But really it's just six characters, C-A-E-S-A-R. Each character has an index. Think of it as like what what you know what place is it in the sequence of characters? In computer science in general, we tend to start counting our indices at zero. I don't know why, but we do, and that can be a little confusing because like everywhere else in life, we start counting at one, right? Um, actually, I do know why. It's it's like an internal implementation thing, but like it's still unfortunate. So the index of that letter C is index zero. The first character is at the zero index. And the second character is at index one. Okay. So this takes some getting used to. So these are the indices. And the length of this string is six. So the length is not the highest number index. The length is the number of characters. That part I think makes sense. The indices will range from zero to the length minus one because we start counting at zero. That part, not so much sense, but it's the way it is. Um, when doing questions involving strings where you're using indices, I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to write the string down on your scratch paper and literally label the indices. It is so easy to be off by one and miss like an otherwise simple like AP style multiple choice question because you're heading your indices wrong. Right? It happens all the time. So take the two seconds, write the string down, label your indices, and then you're not gonna make that mistake. Here's what it looks like when we use this method. We could say, create a local variable letter for a single letter in, the, in our passphrase, or key phrase, sorry. It's of type char, 
and we say init key phrase dot char at and we specify the index. I'm using the local variable i for my index. So i is going to be um, zero the first time this code runs, and then one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five if the thing is Caesar, and then it's going to stop. So, cool. That's the char at method. Super useful, very handy. The char at method is useful when we're trying to get a single character at a specified index, but often we want to get several characters that are within the string. We want to get what's called a substring, meaning part of the bigger string. So there's a method for that as well. This is probably the most challenging method is the substring method. Um, and we'll, we'll document like its specific behavior and do an example together here uh, because of that. So substring returns part of the string starting at the first specified index. And it goes up to, but not including, the second specified index. This whole up to, but not including thing might seem vaguely familiar. You might remember that the next int method on the random class returns a random integer between zero and up to, but not including the number we specify. This pattern shows up over and over again in Java. For those of you familiar with Python, at least this behavior is consistent with Python, right? When we slice strings in Python, it's the same behavior. It goes from the first specified index and up to, but not including the second. Same thing here, okay? So at least there's some consistency, even if it's a little weird. With substring, we can specify two indices, or if only one index is specified, it returns part of the string starting at the specified index still through the end of the string. So that's like a shortcut. Very often we want to start at a specified index and go through the end of the string, so we only specify one parameter, and the second is assumed to be, oh, take all the characters to the end. That's, that's pretty nice. All right, so the good news for those of you familiar with Python is that this method behaves the same way in terms of up to but not including. Here's the bad news. Substring does not support negative indices. So this is only relevant for those of you with a Python background, but if we wanted the second to last character, we can specify the index negative two in Python, super convenient. We can't do that in Java. So for example, but it's still something we want to do, instead of a negative two, we would specify like a knit key phrase dot length minus two. We have to do the extra math, right? So we can't just say negative two, we have to get the length of the whole string and then subtract two from that to get the right index. So not quite as convenient, but it works. All right, I'm gonna copy this portion of the upper comment down here because I wanna keep repeating that because I think it's going to be really helpful to refer to as we work our way through this method. So I still want to see a knit key phrase, and I still want to see C-A-E-S-A-R and the indices as we look through this. All right, so here's our general strategy. We just grabbed the first character in the key phrase. We're going to keep track of that. But now we're going to basically, basically extract that first character from the rest of the string. So we want the substring now that is the rest of the key phrase other than the character we just looked at. So we're going to say string rest of key phrase equals init key phrase dot substring i plus 
one. So starting at the character at index i plus one, grab that character through the end of the string. That's everything that comes after the, the letter we just extracted, like with the char at thing. Here I only passed one argument. So it's implied we go through the end of the string. I could have written it like this. Just for like illustration. I could have said the second parameter is the init key phrase dot length. So it goes up to but not including that index. So let's say i was um, 2. i plus 1 is 3. We'd start with the letter s. Key phrase dot length. Length is 6. We'd go up to but not including 6. Meaning we'd go 3 to 5 inclusive. And my substring would be sar. Substring is one of the methods we're definitely going to practice more. Um, but again, it's one of those things where if you take three seconds and write the string on a sheet of paper and label the indices, you're not going to mess up the substring stuff. If you just try to do it in your head, if I try to do it in my head, I won't speak for you, I'm going to mess up the substring. All right. Substring methods. Let's do another method. All right, so after substring, the next useful method that is also on our AP Quick Reference Sheet is called index of. The index of method returns the index of the start of the first occurrence of the specified string. That sounds so complicated. It's not that bad. If none is found, it returns negative one. So think of index of as a way to search for a substring inside of another string. Okay. It's, it's kind of like searching through a Google Doc, right? When you do like control F and you type in something you want to find, and then it finds it and highlights it. It finds, when you do that in a Google Doc, it finds the first occurrence, right? You can say like find, you can hit like, Control G and find the next one. But it finds the first occurrence. And it highlights the word, um, which is kind of like returning the index of where it, where it starts. Um, so let's say the first time this code runs, um, I is going to be 0. So the character we're going to grab up here in char at letter is going to be the C. So when we run this code here for rest of key phrase, rest of key phrase is going to be the A E S A R. So I'm going to actually copy again this chunk of the comment and update it for the rest of the key phrase. So I'm going to call this rest of key phrase. And we let's say we just grabbed the last five characters. And so the length of rest of key phrase is five. <laughs> we love you. So what would this look like when we use this? We would create a local variable, perhaps called index of type int. And on the rest of key phrase variable, which references a string, I could say index of letter. Since letter is C, it's going to search through the rest of key phrase string looking for a C. And if it finds one, it's going to return that index. And if it doesn't find one, it's going to return negative one. In this case, there is no C here, so it's going to return negative one. Okay. Um, if instead letter was, let's say, S, it would search through this rest of key phrase, and it would find the S. Um, and it would return index 3. And just to be clear, we're using index of to look for a single character. You can search for any number of characters together, right? I could search for a whole word or part of a word or whatever I want. Um, I can pass in a string here um, to search for whatever I, I'm looking for. Cool. Here's our algorithm that we've got so far. 
just to kind of review where we are and where we're headed. Grab the first letter, get the rest of the string, not counting that first letter, search the rest of the string for the first letter. This is checking essentially for a duplicate letter. Okay. And now if we have a duplicate letter, we can deal with it. And if we don't have a duplicate letter, we know that the letter is unique and it's going to be included in our compressed key place. So we get to learn another cool thing about strings. This is great. Let's do um, string concatenation. You've done this before. This is like review. We did a whole activity on this in the last unit. <clears throat> the plus symbol is the string, the string concatenation operator. However, now that we've learned a little bit about operators, our depth of understanding of how this works, I think is going to be a little bit better. Um, so what the string concatenation operator does is it concatenates the second string operand to the end of the first string operand and returns a new, a reference to a new string. There's kind of a weird promotion thing that goes on here as well. Okay. If one or both operands are a string type plus is the string concatenation operator. And what that means is the operands are converted to string objects. So if either the left or the right operand is a string, the other operand will be converted to a string and then string concatenation occurs. So this is a really convenient way to basically convert integers, doubles, whatever to strings. We don't need to use a special method. We just concatenate it with a string and now it's a string. Makes it easy. If neither operand is a string type, just as a reminder, otherwise the plus symbol is the addition operator. Just so we don't forget that addition operator. I don't think we'll forget it, but. So here's a little example of like why this can be useful. Let's say we assign the integer variable x to seven, but then we want to have a variable x as a string. The easiest way to convert an int to a string is to concatenate it with the empty string. This is a string object. It's a string literal. It has no characters, but it's still a string. It's just what we call the empty string. So since the left operand is a string, Java will convert the right operand to a string, concatenate it together, which is just the right operand because this is the empty string, and that new string will be stored, the reference will be stored in x as a string. So when this is done running, x as string will be the value 7 as a string. Like, in, like think of it as like, that's why I quoted it there. Super convenient trick right here. Whoa, sorry. I don't know what I typed. Um, there you go. This is a super convenient little trick, so keep that in mind when you need to convert an int or a double to a string. Yeah? Convert it back, oh, like convert it from a string back to an int? Yeah. There are definitely ways to do that. Um, there are methods, so you can actually use a scanner to do that as one way. There's also methods on a class to do that, which is actually like a genuine. But absolutely, absolutely. It's a lot easier to go this way. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to have to write our first if statement. Again, this is what the next unit will be all about. 
uh, we just want to basically ask the question, hey, if index is equal to negative 1 and the equality or the uh, equality operator is two equal signs in Java, so what this really means is if the letter is not a duplicate, meaning we didn't find it when we searched for it, then it's going to be part of our instance variable key phrase. So we're going to actually concatenate it on to key phrase. Key phrase starts as the empty string. Oops, not equal, plus. So we're going to concatenate on this unique letter. Um, and then we're good. This line of code I just wrote is the same as saying this dot key phrase plus equals letter. So there's also an augmented assignment operator that does string concatenation. So feel free to use that as, as well. I just wanted to be explicit. So. So just to double check, I'm glancing at our Java quick reference. We did length, we did substring, we did index of. There are two more methods on our Java quick reference, but those don't really make any sense until we get to our next unit and we start writing a lot more if statements. Um, so we'll get to those, just not right now. Cool, this is great. Now that we've written this method, Let's go back and revise our constructor to actually call it. So I'm going to go all the way up to the top here. And we're going to, instead of setting key phrase to initial key phrase, we're going to call the this.compress key phrase method. We'll pass initial key phrase as the argument, knowing that this method will get rid of any duplicates and initialize the instance variable key phrase appropriately. So that's, that's good. I got one more thing I want to show you, and we'll do some like questions and comments and stuff like that. This showed up yesterday. Um, but we didn't get into it. These are what are called escape sequences. We use these with strings. There are things we want to put in a string that we can't like literally type in the double quotes because they make other things happen. So if we want a string where there's like multiple lines, we want basically how do we put in the fact that we have this new line? When we're doing the double quotes, we can't hit new line because then we go to a new line of code. We can't hit the inner key on our keyboard. So instead, there is an escape sequence that represents the new line and it's backslash n. That's how we get a new line within a string. All of these escape sequences are the same in most programming languages, including Python. Um, all escape sequences start with the backslash character. So when Java's looking at your string and sees a backslash character, it's like, oh, wait, whatever comes next, I treat in a special way. Okay? So if what comes next is an N, I know that's a new one. Um, what if you want a double quote in your string? You can't just type a double quote because that ends the string, right? Ah, you do backslash double quote. Now you have a double quote in your string. Because backslash is the start of your escape sequence, what if you actually wanted a backslash in the string? Well, surprise, surprise, we do backslash, backslash. Okay? Um, and that's how we get a single backslash in the string. Okay? Um, we don't really use a backspace much. Um, that's more if you're like directly interacting with a terminal. Backslash T is nice. That gives us a tab. There is a slight difference between a new line and a carriage return. We mostly worry about that when we're dealing with files between Windows and Linux. Um, so we're not going to worry too much about that here. Um, we can escape a single quote. You don't need to if you're inside of double quotes. But if you're trying to do a char literal, 
which we put inside of single quotes. How do you make a char literal of a single quote? Oh, you do backslash single quote. Okay. There are many more. These are the most common. Um, so be aware of these. Um, there are certainly times you'll need to use them. Um, so just a, a familiarity thing here. All right, we did a lot of stuff. 